On May 25th of 1996, Kristen Smart would vanish. For 25 years, this would go unsolved until 2021. This is the infuriating case of Paul Flores. Hello, friend, and welcome to High Time Crime. My name's Joel, and on here I specialize in true crime and also professional robot building. Citizens of the Earth, you will be destroyed. But today, we're going over the case of Paul Flores and what he did to Kristen Smart. You're going to learn about how awful of a person he just is. Shocker. For our story, we're heading to San Luis Obispo, California. Specifically, we're heading to California Polytechnic State University, which I've actually covered before with the case of Lacey Peterson. What's ironic is that Scott Peterson, the one who murdered Lacey, comes into play because he went to the school at the same time. But the city has a population of around 48,000 people and seems to be a pretty good place to live. There's a ton of things to do here, but we're gonna skip over that because the setting is based on the college. With a low acceptance rate of 33% and an average cost of $21,000 a year, it's pretty pristine. Not everyone can go here, and so it makes it a bit more fancy. Paul Ruben Flores was born on October 22nd of 1976 to Susan and Ruben Flores. His early childhood gives us a great outlook into the piece of sh that he'd become, or always was. First off, his father was very towards him and his wife, and it's suspected that Paul picked up on these bad habits. While in elementary school, he got into a fight with another kid on the playground. Paul beat him up really badly. Even when the child fell to the ground and stopped fighting back, Paul kept fighting. He didn't stop until he got pulled off by the teachers. The kid who he beat up was admitted to the hospital with a broken eardrum and several other injuries. As Paul kept getting older, things just progressively got worse. His parents were concerned because he wasn't making friendships with anyone. So they bought a pool table in hopes that other kids would come over and want to play with him. It didn't work. From this point forward, he really started to become introverted and, as quoted, withdrawn. Paul was now in high school, and to escape from reality, he turned to alcohol. People that knew him from school said that he would buy a case or two of beer and then drive to Huasna Ranch area where he'd spend all night getting very drunk alone. Two friends of Paul's, Jeremy and Doug, would occasionally wrestle him while they were teenagers. If Paul lost, he was a sore loser. He would be extremely quiet and pout for several hours. Paul desperately wanted to be accepted and respected, but most of the time he wasn't. In fact, he was shunned. Occasionally, however, people would hang out with him because he brought either entertainment or beer. He had a hard time establishing relationships with men and women. Men would laugh and make fun of him because he was always bragging about how he got with this girl and that girl, but nobody believed him. Most of them just looked at him as an oddball, and the girls thought he was creepy. He really lacked any social skills and didn't know how to conversate with people. While Paul was working at a local Jack in the Box, he had a co-worker named Lisa. One night, she had a party and invited him, and he parked his truck in the driveway, but got asked to move it to the street. A friend of Lisa's named Brandy was excited because she was getting her driver's license soon. So she asked Paul if she could move his truck for him, and he tossed her the keys and said, yeah. They got in the truck, and Paul said to drive around the block and then park in front of the house on the street. While she was driving, he kept attempting to slip his hand between her legs and kiss her. She did her best to fight him off and was yelling at him to stop, all while driving the car. Paul then grabbed the steering wheel and told her that she wasn't allowed to go back to Lisa's house until she kissed him. Brandy yelled that she was gonna crash the truck into a nearby house if he didn't stop. He finally stopped, and eventually they arrived back to the party. Paul was tossed out of many other parties because of his behavior and how he would act, especially on alcohol. He was generally very quiet and shy, but once he started to drink, 
he became obnoxious. Paul soon graduated high school, and his parents obviously paid for him to go to California Polytechnic State University. In the months leading up to what he did, alarming signals started to arise. He suspected of making several harassing phone calls to students where he'd just stay quiet and breathe on the other end. In December of 1995, a female student called the San Luis Obispo police on Paul after he climbed up a trellis and refused to get off of her balcony. He left before the officers arrived. Paul was then apprehended by the police, but the student decided not to press charges. In January of 1996, about six weeks after that, he was caught speeding through an intersection and then was asked to perform a breathalyzer. The legal limit is 0.08 and he blew a 0.13. So because of this, he lost his license. Throughout the next few months, he would just sit in his room and then get drunk and then go wander the campus looking for parties. He was terrible at school. He had a 0.6 GPA. He was on the verge of being kicked out and overall was just a terrible person. Paul also had a nickname by some of the girls at school that was Chester the One day, specifically on May 24th of 1996, a party was happening at 135 Crandall Way, which is located near the Cal Poly campus. It was Memorial Day weekend, and people were just having a grand old time. Paul just so happened to be attending this party, but so did someone else, a girl named Kristen Smart. Now, before we dive into what happened, let's find out who she was. Kristen Denise Smart was born on February 20th of 1977 to Stan and Denise Smart. She was born in Augsburg, Germany, and was the first child with two younger siblings. Her parents were stationed there and taught children of military personnel. When Kristen came into this world, she brought an adventurous spirit that never left. She believed in her dreams and always seemed to know the right steps needed to reach them. She was very gifted growing up and spent many summers abroad or trying something new. For example, her sophomore year of high school, she spent the summer just outside of London. The next summer, she wanted to become fluent in Spanish and so she became an exchange student in Venezuela. Her last summer on Earth, the summer of 1995, was what she called her dream job. She was a lifeguard and camp counselor at Camp Mokalia in Hawaii. She absolutely adored this, and it was her passion to adventure. Kristen was a thriving, vibrant, six foot one, 19 year old freshman. She was pursuing her college degree in architecture and was extremely motivated to start her life. But on May 24th of 1996, Kristen was hanging out with three girlfriends, and the time is about 8.30 p.m. They left campus on foot, but soon caught a ride in another friend's truck. Kristen suggested that they go to a birthday party that was being thrown by some fraternity brothers that lived nearby. She was the only one that wanted to go, and so at about 10.30 p.m., they dropped her off at the party on Crandall Way. One of her good friends who was with her and the one who dropped her off, Margarita Campos, said that Kristen was sober at this time. Before she even arrived to the party, Paul was already there and causing problems. A girl named Kendra said that Paul forced himself on her while trying to separate her from her group of friends. Kendra told Kristen to stay away from Paul this evening. The rest of the night, he didn't really talk to anyone. He played a lot of pool and was shooed away by a lot of other party goers. But sometime between 11 to 12, eyewitnesses saw Paul talking to Kristen by the bar. She had a bit of an interesting thing that she did when she went out. She didn't use her real name. She'd either go by Roxy or Trixie, and for this particular night, it was Roxy. Now, Paul and Kristen hadn't really met before, but Paul was interested in her for months. He would hang around her dorm, stare at her, seek her out, and try to interact with her. Kristen was too nice to tell him off, and she never really gave him the time of day. People described his behavior towards her as very creepy, as if he was hunting her. This night, after she talked to Paul, things seemed really off. She was acting like she was on something and very flirtatious and highly active. At one point, she dragged a student into the bathroom with her and closed the door, and she began looking in the mirror and saying, am I ugly? Do you think I'm ugly? Am I ugly? All the while primping. Kristen was seen kissing a basketball player, 
and then was heard insisting that she needs to apologize to him. Some people said that she was drinking tequila. Some people said that she was chugging vodka. Other people said that they don't even remember seeing her with a drink at all. One of the guys who helped throw the party was named Tim Davis, and he saw Paul on top of Kristen, whose name he thought was Roxy, in the hallway. He didn't know if Paul knocked her down on purpose or if it was an accident, but they both got up and went their separate ways. About 90 minutes after Kristen initially arrived to the party, she passed out in the neighbor's lawn face down. So Tim saw her and he went over to wake her up and she told him that she was cold. So Tim and a girl named Cheryl Anderson decided that they were going to walk her home at around 2.30 a.m. They both said that Paul randomly inserted himself to help with this task as well. The entire walk, Paul had his arm around Kristen and she didn't really say anything. Tim left pretty early on to go back to his dorm and while it was just Cheryl, Paul, and Kristen walking, they stopped on a few occasions. Paul would say to Cheryl that she was free to go on ahead, but she didn't. They went to Cheryl's building first, and when they were saying goodbye, Paul asked her for a kiss goodnight. Cheryl found this weird, and she declined his offer, and so he went in for a hug, and she declined that, and she gave him a handshake instead. Then Paul and Kristen walked off into the night, and this was the last time anyone saw Kristen Smart alive. Some friends of hers started to look for her when she failed to turn up for any events and didn't answer her door, but they got no luck. Kristen's roommate, Crystal Calvin, returned to their dorm on Monday, May 27th and saw Kristen's purse and other personal items in the room exactly where she left them on Friday. She then called the university police department twice to tell them what was going on, and later that day, she reached out to Kristen's parents to see if she was at home with them. Before Stan Smart answered the phone, he wasn't remotely ready for what he was about to hear. He thought that he was being contacted because Kristen had done something embarrassing, but sadly, this wasn't the case. He received a phone call that every parent dreads and wishes to never hear that their child was missing. Now we're going to look into why it took 25 years for Kristen and her family to finally get justice. I believe that most of it all comes down to incompetency. <sighs> Surprising. It's obvious. Incredibly obvious who the culprit was, and the police knew this from day one. On May 28th, 1996, the day that Kristen was reported missing, investigator Mike Kennedy spoke to Paul in room number 128 in the Santa Lucha Hall, remember his room number. During this conversation, Paul was sitting on the bed located on the north or left side of the room, which indicated it was his. Two days later, on May 30th, investigator Mike Kennedy and R. Cudworth interviewed Paul again. Mike asked Paul to describe his activities from the last time that he saw Kristen Smart and to go backwards. I'm going to read you what Paul said. And in your mind, think about if this sounds like an innocent person. And remember, Kristen used a fake name, which was Roxy. Okay, um, she walked that way. I walked that way. That's the last time I saw her. Then the other girl left at the, at the corner over there. And then, uh, and, and a couple times, like, on the way, maybe probably twice, you know, I went like that, just gave her kind of like a hug because she was freezing. I, I, I remember that. And then I thought, I remember one time over the, the probably was about the health center, like I told, uh, because, uh, because Roxy was walking real slow and so then uh I I told the other girl that she can go if she wanted to. I remember saying that to her and then uh because I was like and then uh and I don't even remember what we were talking about during the whole time. We were just we we're just walking. Ah gibberish. Paul also had a black eye and scratches and some other random things. How he got them, he changed his story multiple times. First, he said he got elbowed while playing basketball. Then, during another police interview on June 19th, 
he admitted he lied about how he received the injury to his eye. He said he actually got it from his Ford Ranger. Apparently, at around 2 o'clock in the morning on Memorial Day weekend, he was installing a radio because he was selling his truck. He then hit the steering wheel with his eye, and he asked the question, but, but, like, how often do people hit their eye on the steering wheel? Uh... Probably not very frequently. It's why you don't make up stories on the spot. The police asked him why he lied, and he said that it just didn't seem like a very likely thing to do and that he didn't want to seem like a klutz. Right. Paul also told his friend and roommate Derek Say something that's very chilling. About one week after the disappearance of Chris and Smart, the two had a conversation. I don't know how they were joking or why they were joking about this, but Derek said, you killed her and drug her body off. And so Paul replied by saying, yeah, she's at my house eating lunch with my mom. What an absolute yikes. On June 29th of 1996, a huge search was conducted on the Cal Poly campus using cadaver dogs. Four dogs searched the Santa Lucia Hall separately, and each dog alerted to room number 128. Paul's room. Each time the door was open to the room and the dogs were allowed to enter at separate times, all four of them alerted on a corner of a bed mattress on the north or left side of the room. Paul's side of the room. The dogs showed no interest in the other mattress or any other part of the room. So this same day that mattress was seized as evidence and removed from the room. The cadaver dogs were then brought back and once again each dog alerted to the left side where the mattress was removed. The dogs were trained very well and were able to detect human composition through either fluids or odors. The same weekend Kristen went missing, construction was started in Paul's mom's backyard. A lot of construction. Specifically, cement and newly constructed concrete planter boxes. One of those concrete planter boxes was 6 foot by 3 foot, which is eerily similar to the dimensions of a grave. The address to this house was 529 East Branch Street in Arroyo Grande, California. The same house was rented to a couple named the Lassiters, Mary and Joseph to be exact. On January 24th of 1997, Joseph had an interview with the police. In the backyard of the house that they were renting by the florists, they found an earring that was hooped with beads and a flat piece that connected to the ear. It was a turquoise color. The earring had red stuff on it, which resembled that of blood. Joseph gave the San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Office this earring, and they ended up misplacing it, and it's yet to be found. Yes, they lost a piece of evidence that was potentially huge. When Kristen Smart's parents were asked about these earrings and if she wore a similar pair, they said that she did. This was her favorite pair. The exact same type of earrings. Also, Mary and Joe, every day for about a month or so, would hear a beeping sound coming from the backyard underneath the ground at around 4.20 in the morning. Kristen used to wear a watch and it's speculated that she had an alarm set for 420 because she worked as a lifeguard at Cal Poly. She also partaked in the good green and Rastafarian culture, and it was a bit of an inside joke. Searches were then done using ground penetrating radar of the backyard, and it produced a weird anomalous reading under a concrete planter box. Six cadaver dogs were brought to the house, and they showed an interest in the corner of the yard. One of those dogs' names was Buster, the most famous cadaver dog. He actually found over 200 sets of human remains. It usually doesn't take anywhere close to how long it took the San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Office to get a search warrant. In some cases, it could literally take 15 minutes, but for some reason, it took four years. They knew about the cement and planter boxes that was being poured all over the yard and the earring that was found as well. They knew that the last person to see Kristen alive had a black eye and scratches all over him. They knew he lied about how he got his black eye multiple times. What on God's green earth were they doing? The police also got a search warrant to search Paul's truck. But when they went to, he told them that it was either lost or it got stolen. What? Where did it go? But when they searched the backyard of the Flores' property four years later, they decided to take a vote as to whether or not they would dig up the concrete planter boxes. When the ballots got tallied up, 
it went against digging up the concrete planter boxes. Once again, what is wrong with this county's police department? A bit after Kristen disappeared, Paul attended a party at a friend's house. The friend's mother asked Paul right to his face in front of everyone, what did you do with Kristen Smart? He immediately became withdrawn and turned red for a few moments, then he turned pale. Someone at the party was videotaping this, and so they turned it into law enforcement so that way they could make a copy. The person who filmed this never got their video back. The police asked Paul to submit a polygraph test and he accepted, but he kept putting it off. Finally, one day, the district attorney investigators picked him up and told him it was time to take the test. The detectives say that he turned white and was incredibly nervous. When they arrived to the conference room, Paul ended up not taking the test but was interviewed for 90 minutes. His body language in it was alarming. When the investigators began to press him on the fact that he was the last one seen with Kristen, he pulled his arms into his t-shirt, scrunched over at the waist in his chair, and lifted his feet off of the floor going into a fetal position. He then called the investigators bluff and said, if you're so smart, then tell me where the body is. Shortly after, he walked out of the interview and his mother then got him a lawyer, and from this point forward, he would provoke his Fifth Amendment right due to the fact that Kristen Smart's family also filed a $40 million wrongful death suit in November of 1997. He was interviewed again with his lawyer, and this is the only thing he said. I'd like to ask you what documents you have reviewed in preparation uh, for your uh, deposition testimony here today. On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. On May 25th of 2002, six years after Kristen Smart disappeared, she was officially pronounced legally dead. Her parents would continue to search for as long as they could, even go as far as hunting down the florists and following them. But even through all of that, Paul still wasn't charged, and it would take 25 years until justice finally got served. Let's try to understand why. You're about to learn who the real Paul Flores is. You've already learned about how awful of a person he is, but what's revealed next is wild. Remember how I said earlier that Scott Peterson, who murdered his wife Lacey, comes into play? It's only for a moment, and he got interviewed by police and was potentially a suspect because he went to the same school at the same time. What were they putting in the water there? But Scott's still an awful person, and this isn't about him. There is no reason that it should have ever taken that long to arrest Paul. There was a ton of evidence pointing directly at him and only him, and the police botched everything in the way. Some people speculate that this could have been on purpose for a few different reasons, though they're just theories. One reason is that during 1996 at Cal Poly Technic State University, believe it or not, at a bookstore on campus, they sold ketamine. Ketamine is a popular date drug, and all you needed to purchase it was your student ID. They sold it because it was primarily used by veterinary students. The drug takes effect within about 10 minutes and usually lasts for about two hours, but it can last much longer. It causes confusion and makes you feel tripped out. It's theorized that because Cal Poly helps the economy of San Luis Obispo run, that Cal Poly authorities possibly took overt steps to destroy evidence. This allowed Paul to roam scot-free for years and even start a normal life. But he's sick and very, very demented. Several years after Kristen disappeared, Paul was living with a girlfriend in Lawndale, California. Some of their friends came over to their apartment to have some drinks and just hang out. Paul's girlfriend and friends began to tease him about something that he said or did that was funny. He felt disrespected and grabbed a butter knife from the table and moved behind his girlfriend and put her in a chokehold. The whole room got quiet and instantly the mood went from light to dark. Everyone stopped smiling. A friend later told Paul's girlfriend that she needed to get out of that relationship, and she did. None of those people knew anything about his past. But that's not even the worst of what he did. 
On February 5th of 2020, a big breakthrough came when Paul's Los Angeles area residents and vehicles were searched for specific items of evidence. The San Luis Obispo Sheriff's Office also wiretapped his phone and Paul's mother's, father's, and sister's houses. Two months later in April, they came back with another search warrant, and during this one, they found physical evidence relating to the murder of Kristen Smart. They found multiple videos of Paul drugging and women while they were passed out. The file was labeled as practice and had a bunch of terrible titles that had exactly what happened to these women. Paul was arrested at 9.45 a.m. on February 11th of 2021 on suspicion of being a felon in possession of a firearm. By 10.47 p.m., he was released after he posted a $35,000 bond. How on earth, after finding what they found, could he have possibly been out on bond or even had the option? Then in March, search warrants were issued for the Arroyo Grande home of Ruben Flores, Paul's father. More evidence was found due to a soil disturbance about the size of a casket and the presence of human blood. The blood, however, was too degraded to extract a DNA sample. Then another month later, on April 13th, the San Luis Obispo County Sheriff's Office detectives arrested Paul and his father. His father was accused of helping him bury Kristen's body and then digging up her remains and moving them. On October 18th of 2022, Paul Flores was convicted by the jury and is facing 25 years to life in prison. His sentencing date was set for December 9th of 2022, but they delayed it. I still don't think he's going to get off very easily. His father, Ruben, was found not guilty, but there's a lot of oddities about him. One time, he told a phone contractor by the name of Gus that that deserved to die, referencing Kristen. Another time, when Ruben was at a party, he told someone that Kristen was rolled up in carpet and buried in concrete. But a lot of theories and evidence points to him being guilty, but not beyond a reasonable doubt. Paul Flores, however, is 100% guilty, and he should have been arrested and convicted on the day that he was apprehended in 1996. The police are absolutely to blame here, and whether it's because it's on purpose or whatnot, I really don't know. About a month after Kristen disappeared, Paul attended a party and met a girl named Jennifer Hudson. She was 17 years old at the time, and the gathering was small in a rural area outside of Arroyo Grande called Huasna. They briefly interacted, but during this, the two were sitting on a couch. The radio was on, and messages about Kristen Smart's disappearance were happening during commercial breaks. Paul made a very chilling comment and said, that was a tease and I was done playing with her. And he then said he either put her or buried her under his ramp in Huasna. Jennifer said that when Paul said this, he was cold and it's as if the life behind his eyes didn't exist. He had no smirk, no smile, no tone of I'm being funny, and he was really pale. Two weeks later, they ended up seeing each other again and Jennifer immediately became ill. Paul asked her to hang out, but she declined and went back home, definitely for the best. We know that Paul is an awful, terrible person. The things that he's done and was allowed to continue to do are heinous. He would drug women and then take advantage of them and, in at least one instance, murder them. But there's another woman that went missing while he was working for Coca-Cola in 2007. Amber Lee Hill was working at the Downey Coca-Cola plant when she went missing on January 9th of 2007. 15 days later, on January 24th, her body was found wrapped in bubble wrap that was used in the bottling plant. Both her and Paul worked during the same shift in the same department, but at different plants. Right now, there's no connection between them, but Amber's family and her sister believe that Paul had something to do with it. He had multiple videos of him doing terrible things to women, and so anything's possible. He was protected for 25 years for whatever reason, but at least now he's finally going to be put away. He's what we would consider the worst of the worst, an excuse for a human, someone that deserves no sympathy, but deserves to be locked away for their entire life. Hell is very, very close for Paul Ruben Flores and those who helped him, aka his parents. As for Kristen, I feel awful for her and her family because she never got to experience the life she deserved. Sadly, it was cut short for no reason whatsoever. Kristen was shy, but adventurous. She loved to travel. 
She loved the ocean, and she would have loved the life that she was destined to live. I'm sorry that law enforcement failed you and your family for so many years. I genuinely hope that wherever she is, she's resting peacefully and that one day her body can be recovered. Closure is needed, and without it, it tears you apart. This case was a bit of a tough one to get through and was definitely irritating. But anyways, thank you for watching this episode of High Time Crime. If true crime is your thing, then please subscribe and hit the like button because that's all we do. I also have a second account with my brother named Horrifying where we tell stories about everything paranormal. This includes true crime, mysteries, and things that are just downright spooky. I'd greatly appreciate if you subscribe to that too. I hope you have a great rest of your day. Take care, friend.